If you're looking for a super ultra wide monitor, this might just be the end game. It's called the Philips Evnia 49M2C8900, which sports a super ultra wide 49 inch curved 1440p 240Hz QD OLED panel. It also has got AMD FreeSync technology, certification with NVIDIA G-Sync, and better still, Display HDR True Black 400, which gives you a lifelike HDR reproduction. You've then also got a built-in KVM switch and also Philips Ambiglow technology. Now all of this comes packaged at roughly £1,600, at least at the time of filming and in the UK. Now in this video, which has been sponsored by the manufacturer, I'll be covering everything you need to know about it so that you can make your own informed purchasing decision. So jumping straight in, let's talk about its input lag. And here I had it objectively tested at just 0.6 milliseconds. Indeed, it is actually really impressive in this department. But the same could be said about some of the recent monitors that I've tested because they actually all do a very good job. Subjectively, I will also say that while playing a game such as Counter-Strike 2, which is actually very important when you have a low input lag, this monitor actually did a phenomenal job. Now it's worth noting over here that these tests were conducted with the low input lag mode enabled through the monitor's OSD. I'm not really sure why the manufacturer provides you the option, but nonetheless there are no disadvantages of having it permanently enabled. Now when it comes to the overall response time, this is where this OLED panel really does shine. Because if you're comparing it to the likes of IPS, VA or TN panels, this will actually completely trump them out of the water. Indeed over here, if you look at the OSRTD tool test, you can see that the average initial time, which is often referred to as average D to G, sits at a stonkingly low 0.94 milliseconds. And it hits 100% of the refresh rate window, which is 240 hertz. Furthermore, the visual experience is absolutely impeccable. Both at 120Hz and at 240Hz, which I tested, you can see there's no inverse ghosting behind the UFO ghosting test. Now, in terms of the overall motion clarity, this monitor does also meet a Visa certification, which is more specifically Clear MR 13000, which is the highest scale that one can achieve. So it's great to see that the overall motion clarity, at least according to Visa and of course Philips, is absolutely top notch. So moving swiftly on, I would like to talk about VR technologies. In other words, AMD FreeSync Premium Pro certification and Nvidia G-Sync. Now here, the monitor has been certified by the latter. However, it's not to be confused with a native G-Sync module monitor. If you want some more information about G-Sync technologies, make sure you check out my dedicated video up on your pop-up banner or go down towards one of the links down in the description below. Now the monitor's range stems from 50Hz up to 240Hz. And also, when I had Adaptive Sync enabled through the monitor's OSD and NVIDIA G-Sync selected via my NVIDIA control panel, I noticed that the low input lag mode became greyed out through the monitor's OSD although it didn't seem to hamper my experiences. Furthermore, I did notice a little bit of flickering on the NVIDIA Pendulum demo or while playing a game such as Destiny 2 with HDR enabled. Still, it didn't seem to throw me off in the slightest, and I didn't encounter any sort of black screen issues. Now, in terms of this, when playing a game like Destiny 2, it gave me a tear-free gaming experience, which meant that the overall visual experience was absolutely phenomenal. Now, furthermore, the monitor has got Display HDR True Black 400 certification, which in other words means that the overall brightness will be limited to roughly 400 nits, but will give you a real lifelike reproduction, better than something that you would be able to expect elsewhere. Now, it's worth noting over here that if you do want to get a peak brightness of up to 1000 nits, which is absolutely blinding, you'll want to go outside of the True Black 400 mode via the OSD and go via the HDR Vivid mode. This is certainly something that you might want to do in certain scenarios, but in my case, I like the fantastic color accuracy of the True Black 400 mode. Indeed, while playing a game like Destiny 2, it really did pop in terms of the overall color and also in terms of the overall accuracy. Next up, I would like to talk about connectivity because of course it's very important for you to output the maximum refresh rate and resolution. And here it runs at 5120 times 1440p at 240 Hz. And given its 48.9 inch form factor and the 32 by nine aspect ratio, you've got a PPI of 108.77. Indeed, text does look very sharp, even though you have got that super ultra wide format. I'll be talking about some of the limitations of OLED technology, more specifically fringing effect, a little bit later. 
Now here, when it comes to actually using the monitor, you have got a singular DisplayPort 1.4 input, two HDMI 2.1 ports, and also USB Type-C connectivity, which also delivers power. Handy, for example, if you're connecting up a laptop. Now here, when I was connected over to my desktop computer, I was able to get 1440p at 240Hz at 10-bit over DisplayPort, and up to 12-bit one connected over HDMI. Now it does also have a dedicated console mode, and this is by you selecting the 120Hz HDMI toggle via the monitor's OSD. This will effectively give you the ability to utilize the entirety of the screen while using a console which does not natively support the ultra-wide format, let alone a super ultra-wide format. Now indeed in this respect I noticed a resolution of 3840 times 2160 in other words 4K, and I had it at 120Hz. Furthermore, over HDMI, I was also able to run NVIDIA G-Sync technology, and therefore means VR technologies do operate over HDMI, and for modern day consoles, for example the Xbox or PlayStation, you should be able to utilize AMD FreeSync technology, therefore giving you a tear-free gaming experience. Now with the gaming section out of the way, let's talk about image quality. And as a reminder, you have got that 49 inch form factor which has got a 1800R curvature and you've also got a glossy panel. Just worth bearing in mind if you're gonna be using it in a very bright room or of course if you have direct sunlight shining straight onto it. Now the monitor has got a dedicated sRGB mode and you've also got the ability to adjust the brightness which is actually very appreciated. Now in said mode, I noticed a gamut coverage of 96.5% and a gamut volume of 98.9%. Below you can see how it compares to the sRGB standard. It also gets an average DLT of 1.44 and a maximum of 3.01, therefore meaning it is very much suitable for serious image editing work or video grading. The test of contrast ratio was infinity to 1 due to the OLED panel technology and its measured white point in comparison to the 6504 Kelvin target sat at 6160 Kelvin. It also has got a gamma curve which sits relatively close to the 2.2 standard, although you will be able to note that it does deviate slightly. Now outside of the sRGB mode, it does actually have a wider color gamut, as you'll be able to note over here, where the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 color spaces have been positively affected. Now comparing it to the Adobe RGB standard, not to be confused with the sRGB standard that I mentioned before, you can see below how it compares. As for the average Del-T and maximum Del-T, they sit at 2.31 and 6.35 respectively. Indeed, it isn't exactly as color accurate in comparison to editing in the sRGB space. The tested contrast ratio does not change, although the measured white point does slightly shift at 6240 Kelvin at 100%. As for the gamma curve, yet again you can see how it compares to the 2.2 standards. Now you might have also noticed the overall brightness figures, and indeed I clocked in 1002 nits in terms of the peak HDR brightness, however with the true black 400 mode I clocked in 457 nits. As for its overall SDR brightness, it got up to 244 nits, and it got all the way down to 48 nits. As for the overall brightness uniformity, it did actually fare very well across the board, which is actually quite surprising. And furthermore, it also has zero backlight bleed, and that is indeed due to the overall OLED panel technology. Now I did say I would cover some of the limitations of owning an OLED, or more specifically a QD OLED, which is present on this Philips Evnia monitor. And indeed over here you've got the burn-in effect. Now this has actually been mitigated as much as possible by the manufacturer because you've got certain panel care technology, for example pixel orbiting, screensaver, and also pixel refresh, which can be done automatically when you power off the monitor or indeed when it enters a standby state, or can be done manually via the monitor's OSD, or of course if you press yes on the auto pop-up warning, which will occur after certain intervals. Of course, if you do not want this auto warning to pop up, you can disable it completely via the monitor's OSD, and therefore means that you're not gonna get any sort of downtime or any sort of distractions. Now elsewhere, there's also the fringing effect. Now for those people who are not aware, the OLED panels have got a slightly different subpixel layout, and therefore means that when you're looking at text, it will look a little bit different, at least if you're comparing it to regular LCD technology, for example, an IPS, a VA, or a TN panel. Now to put that into context, I've got the AOC Aegon Pro AG274QS, a 27 inch 1440p 300Hz IPS panel. And when compared and contrast directly with the Philips Evnia monitor, you can see that the QD OLED panel certainly does have that fringing effect. 
With that said, if you do look at some other OLED technology, more specifically WOLEDs, the QD OLED panel is certainly very much acceptable. For someone who does look at a lot of text on a day-to-day -day basis, I didn't actually have any sort of problems when it came to your overall text clarity. Yes, indeed, it's not going to be as good as LCD panels due to the different sorts of sub-pixel layout, but it's just something I thought I should highlight in this video. Now, with all that out of the way, I would like to talk about the monitor's build quality. And here it's got a three-side ball design with a relatively thin bottom bezel, which has actually got a silver finish to it, which matches the white colour scheme that the manufacturer has gone for. Here you have also got a built-in stand. It provides you height, swivel and tilt adjustments, all of which are very much appreciated. However, given the overall size and form factor of the monitor, it's no surprise that it can't be rotated. It is also worth considering the triangular shape of the stand, and therefore you'll want to make sure that it actually fits on your setup. Make sure you check out the dimensions and indeed the specifications on the manufacturer's website. Now here you have got the ability to replace the stand altogether, because it has got Visa compatibility, meaning that you can mount it on a monitor arm, or indeed if you have got the luxury on a multi-monitor setup. Now what really stands out is the three-sided Philips Ambiglow technology, which is present on this monitor. For those who are not aware, the RGB lights which are positioned around the back of the monitor will project on a nearby wall. You can also have this give you a bit more of that immersive experience when you're consuming content. Of course, it might not be everyone's cup of tea because it might be a little bit too distracting, specifically for example if you're paying fast-paced shooters, but if you're going to be looking at cinematic scenes, then it's something that you might actually want to enable. And indeed, this can be done via the monitor's OSD. Here you can adjust the ambiglow settings or indeed fully disable them. Now speaking about the monitor's OSD, it can be accessed through a small little joystick button found behind at the right hand side of the monitor. However, better still, the manufacturer provides you a little remote, which means that you can adjust your settings on the fly. And the monitor's OSD is actually very comprehensive and allows you a degree of customization which is perfectly reinforced by the fact that you have got a multi-band EQ via the monitor's OSD, which is actually quite a rarity. Nonetheless, over here, I actually preferred using the DTS sound profiles, and that's because they actually do sound pretty good. For built-in monitor speakers, you have got two 7.5-watt tweeters and two 7.5-watt woofers with a flow port, and therefore meaning that you're going to get a pretty lively and very much loud sound. Now to conclude, the monitor has got a built-in KVM switch, which is certainly appreciated for those people who want to use the monitor for productivity. Here you have got the ability to plug in your mouse and keyboard directly into one of the four USB Type-A ports. Therefore means that if you're going to be connected over to a desktop computer, for example over HDMI or DisplayPort, with the included USB Type-B to Type-A cable, and then simultaneously connected over to a laptop via the USB Type-C port, it means that you can switch between the two sources while using the same sort of peripherals. If you want some more information about how a KVM switch operates, make sure you check out my video up on your pop-up banner, or follow down the links in the description below. So there we have it. Hopefully you've enjoyed my detailed overview of the Philips Evnia 49M2C8900. I'd be curious to know what you make of it down in the comment section below, and of course if it's something that you will be interested in buying. If there's anything that I've missed in this video, make sure you ask me down in the comment section below. And it goes without saying that if you've enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been Totally Dubbed, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.